General Sergei Carleton is 42. He is distant, reserved, and has been in the British Army since the age of 14. And he's been here before. He was wounded at the Plains of Abraham seven years ago. The English merchants believe this governor will favor their cause, but Carleton has a surprise for them. Barring catastrophe shocking to think of, this country must, to the end of time, be peopled by the Canadian race, who have already taken such firm root and got to so great height that any new stock transplanted will be totally hid and imperceptible among them. He believes that Catholics should be able to hold office, that French civil law should be restored to the Canadians. Carleton also has very practical strategic reasons for placating the Canadians. To the south, there is growing restlessness among the American colonies. Carleton fears the Americans will rise in revolution and that France will support them. Should France begin a war in hopes that the British colonies will push matters to extremities, and she adopt the project of supporting them in their independent notions, Canada probably will then become the principal scene where the fate of America may be determined. Carleton sails to London, determined to be the architect of an enduring peace in Canada. But he finds London is more concerned with its American colonies. In Boston, crates of tea are dumped in the harbor to protest new taxes. To retaliate, Britain shuts down the port. It abolishes elections in the colonies and passes coercive laws denounced as the intolerable acts. Carleton has now been in London for four years, warning that the tensions in Canada must be resolved. And he is not alone. A Canadian arrives from Quebec with a dramatic intervention. Francois Babi fought with distinction against the British invaders of Canada. Now he is in London, bearing a petition from the most prominent Canadian families, supporting Carleton. Dissipate these fears and this uneasiness by restoring to us our ancient laws and customs, and to extend our province to its former boundaries. Grant us, in common with your other subjects, the rights and privileges of citizens of England. Then our fears will be removed and we shall pass our lives in tranquility and happiness and we shall be ready to sacrifice them for the glory of our prince and the good of our country. The Quebec Act passes the House of Commons in the spring of 1774. It restores to Canada all the interior lands which the Americans are claiming. It guarantees the Canadians their religion and restores French civil law. The Catholic Canadians are allowed to hold public office. The accommodation established here between French and English will become a cornerstone of the next 200 years of Canadian history. But in the American colonies, history will record this differently. The Quebec Act is the final intolerable act. The dream of an English-American empire embracing the entire continent is blocked. The New York Journal expresses the outrage. The finger of God points out a mighty empire to our sons. The savages of the wilderness were never expelled to make room in this, the best part of the continent, for idolaters and slaves. It appears to be the greatest stake that was ever played for. 
no less whether Americans and their endless generations might enjoy the common rights of all mankind or be worse than Eastern slaves. The trial must now come to issue as open war is declared by the Boston Port Act and above all, the Quebec Bill. Open war with Britain comes six months later, on April the 19th, 1775, at Lexington. The American colonies slide into a chaotic revolution. Now Canada will have to fight for its very existence.